But human weapon, weapons cannot liberate the souls of sinners. Human weapons cannot sanctify saints. Human weapons have no effect on the spiritual realm and realities of what is happening here in Vancouver. What do we try to fight these, these spiritual wars with? Human cunning or reason? Strategies or, or rationalism, human plans, ingenuity, organization, skills, elegance, personality, charisma. These are not effective for the wars that you and I are fighting in the mind. The delusions that enter into us, charisma is not going to do anything about it. But Paul is calling us to not have a temporary gain or a temporary victory with our reasons of fighting this war. But he's saying to us, don't you want to go to God's arsenal to find yourself in truth and not believing the lies that we currently live out of? So what are these weapons? Ephesians chapter 6 says this, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present future, present darkness. Think of the formidable opponents that we are up against, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, and all prayer and supplication to the end. Keep alert. All perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. I feel like at times, um, God, or maybe even just like angels looking at us upright in life, is kind of like the way that I watch five year old soccer. If you ever watch five year old soccer? It's the most infuriating thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Bro, have you never seen Messi keep the form, left flank? No! What do these five year olds do? Ball! They all just run like a giant amoeba of mass and tiny humanness, right? And you're just frustrated and you're watching these kids, you're like, you have no idea how to do this. You're just yelling, you have no idea how to do this. I'm picturing there's like 10 angels just chilling, watching us, going through just the, the worst times in our life and we're going like, man, you know what I need? I need like a good strategy for the next three days. I gotta get a good sleep, drink more water and I'm gonna be fine. And they're all just going like, you don't know what you're doing. There's a different spiritual reality here. And even he goes, pray, pray. Some of us are like, I don't know. Prayer. I always fall asleep. I, I always have the problem where I pray. And I'm like, Lord, this is so good. The problem is I don't even realize where I've lost myself in my prayer. I, as a kid, I used to think that if I didn't say amen, it didn't count. I had to restart the prayer. Prayer. What this is saying is prayer has a spiritual impact that you are not going to see. And yet we find ourselves just too busy to pray. It makes no sense. Prayer, the thing that held God's hand away from judgment of nations. Prayer. The very thing that halted the waters from, from, from moving down and raining onto the nation. Prayer, the thing that made the sun stand still. Prayer, the one that Jesus could have called legions of angels down. Prayer, the thing that moved in faithfulness his nations towards his glory. Prayer, but we are just way too busy. We don't know what they're doing. We're fighting against formidable opponents. Look at Paul's language, that we are called to destroy strongholds. Imagine if you ever seen the movie Troy. It's a city with ginormous walls, and you have to destroy those walls. And there's one thing that I think is really interesting about this imagery. Who is on offense? A lot of us take spiritual warfare and we go, man, Satan's against me, he's coming after me. 
Oh man, this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being attacked, I'm being, I'm being pressed. Who is on the offense? See, so the hope of this spiritual reality is we know how the score ends. We know who wins this fight. And we are on the winning team. Which means that the gospel of Christ in our nation and our city is on the offense, not the defense. Imagine if we had a church that believed in the fact that the gospel of Christ is on the offense, not on the defense. Church is declining. People are leaving church, so on and so forth. We get into this little like pity party where every, we, we become, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Who is on the offense? God is on the move. It is very Western of us to go, man, the church is declining. It is blowing up globally. Why? Why has it not done the same here? Because we have not given enough credence to what this is saying, the spiritual realities. We are fighting with weapons that have no effect and we need to get back to the things that matter. Go and pray. Pray. Be committed to what God's trying to do. Allow Him, our dependency on Him to do the work. Not that we're going to do massive marketing campaigns to get more people into the church and do this or that. No, no, no. We are going to go down and we are going to pray in order to change a city, in order to change a nation. It's because He is doing the work and He says to us, Hey, I want you to come along. How good is that? That we are actually invited into the process of being on offense for the gospel to destroy the strongholds and the lies that are in people's minds about who he is and their lack of reality in the world. This is why it's so important for us to destroy these things. These things, the, the interesting part about this is the word fortress here can also mean prison. It's interesting because these these ideas, that the, the fortresses that we are called to demolish, people are entrenched and ensconced in these realities. These great fortresses actually don't protect them. They become imprisoned by them. What they believe they are in refuge of, they are actually prisoners of. And their fortresses ultimately become their tombs. And we are called to utterly destroy them. So what are these fortresses? In verse 5, Paul says this. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. It's arguments, it's thoughts and ideas, it's opinions, it's reasonings, it's philosophies, it's theories, it's ideologies, it's all of these forts that people hold up to themselves, these strongholds, these are ideological strongholds, these are philosophical strongholds, these are religious strongholds. And in all of these forts where people are trying to hide, they actually find themselves in prison. And it's the gospel of Christ which is the only thing that can get people out of this. It's not going to be great psychology. It's not going to be a great day plan. No, it is only the truth and reality of who Christ is entering into the heart of someone that all of the darkness that enters into the mind is evaporated in a moment. That's why this is so important. As uh, Dallas Willard puts it, ideas, not tyrants, are the primary stronghold of evil in the human soul and society. By thoughts, we mean everything that we are conscious of. Ideas are very general. It's the model of the assumptions of reality for us. They are patterns of interpretations, historically developed and socially shared. And this, these ideas get the better of us all the time. Uh, I had a moment of, of kind of epiphany where I, I caught my ideas working. I was lying in bed and I thought to myself, did I lock the door? Then I said, what if somebody came into my house with the door unlocked? What would I do? Well, I have this pen right next to my door. I wonder if I could have enough torque to like jab it into their neck. <laughs> well, then I'd go to jail. But then I'd go to court and then maybe I could actually represent myself in court like that guy from Suits. <laughs> Whatever happened to Suits? Is Suits on Netflix? Drive to Survive just got onto Netflix. I need to watch some Drive to Survive. And in that moment, it clicked in. How did I just get here? And I tracked that whole story. Doesn't that happen to us? Yeah. All of a sudden, you're like, where am I right now? For some reason, I'm thinking about Irish dance, and I was asking my mom what time it was. What is happening, right? And that's obviously a silly example. But imagine layer after layer, time after time, and it's not an example that is silly. Imagine a little girl, five years old, she's sitting at the dinner table, she spills milk, 
her dad, who had an abusive past, he was hurt and he, he has uh, uh, not the ability to restrain his anger, just absolutely flips out when she spills the milk. She's a child, she doesn't understand, oh, my dad probably has anger issues. She tells herself, I'm the problem, I've been a mistake. She grows up and she's the oldest of all of the kids in the house, and her dad was also the oldest, and he was treated a certain kind of way, so what does he do? He just rebounds the treatment that he had onto her, and she begins to tell herself, no, it's not actually because um, I've done something wrong, it's because I am wrong. He doesn't treat anybody else like this, he only treats me like this. I am the problem. She gets old enough and her parents send her to boarding school, which is already affirming all of these things into her mind. As she gets to the gate and she's about to board onto the plane, her parents, who love her very much, but sometimes are very hard to be able to say that, they have, um, they're trying to, to hold all of their emotions and they're just trying to keep it together at the gate. And they're trying to hold all the emotions. And the daughter sees her parents unemotional, not caring about her leaving. When she gets onto the airplane, she sits down in the seat and she says, my parents don't care about me. So she gets to the school and she grows up a little bit more. Now she's trying to find all of the attention in all the worst places because she never got it at home. And not only that, she has given herself to studying and getting top grades. Why? Because she's actually trying to live for the affirmation of her father that she never got. See how different that is? It's layer after layer after layer. It's time over time over time and we find ourselves buried beneath the lines, compounding on the world. It's like a doctor that is so convinced of a patient's symptoms and the diagnosis that he gives, that all of a sudden the diagnosis is wrong and he's so convinced of it that all of a sudden now he has to try and, 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 and give medicine for the symptoms of this. And because the symptoms now get worse, now he's more treating the symptoms than the source and it just keeps happening. We're getting further and further and further and further and further away where all of a sudden he's treating something that has nothing to do with the original problem and he's just stuck there. Imagine that not one time over, not two times over, a hundred times over with the lies that you and I believe about our soul. That is the condition of where we're at. Lies, believed, sin, committed over and over and over again. And Satan is not very clever. He's kind of a one-trick pony in the way that he operates. It's just lies and deception. Lies and deception, lies and deception. Thomas Brooks, uh, an ancient theologian wrote this, temptation essentially gets you to have too high a view of yourself. So you go and do things you shouldn't. It's basically making the point that Satan only works with temptation and accusation. Accusation is the devil's way of trying to get you to have too low and self-hating a view of yourself. So you'll go and do things that you shouldn't. Both ways work. And temptation, Satan is actually hiding God's holiness from you and how much he hates sin. He hides that from you and plays up the love. In accusation, he hides God's love from you and he plays up God's holiness and his wrath on sin and he hides God's love. This is what I'm trying to get to. It's a very simple idea. You will always live towards your strongest thoughts. You will always live towards your strongest thoughts. Which is why Jesus is so serious about the things that enter into your mind. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Where he says, even when you have hated a person, you've already committed murder. Why? He says, even if you've lusted over someone, you've already committed adultery. Why? Because you're practicing in your mind the sin. And the only thing that is halting you from committing that action is not goodwill or not your will or is not holiness it's just the only thing that is lacking from you committing that action is just the opportunity if you're just practicing that sin over and over and over and over and over again jesus promises that you will always live towards your strongest thoughts whatever enters into your mind you will eventually live out whatever enters into your mind will eventually come out into your life. And good is always associated with true representation of the spiritual reality that God gives to us. But evil must always distort and confound these realities in order to seduce us into participating into our own self-destruction. 
You see how heinous this is? Nobody ever counterfeits a one dollar bill. They're only going to counterfeit the things that really matter and have a lot of weight. Which means that the questions and the delusions that come into our mind are always on the big topics. Who is God? Does he love me? Is he involved in my life? Does he care at all? Who am I? Do we have value? Do I have any significance for anyone? Does anybody around me actually care about me? Your relationships, that how does my life actually work? And the thing that's common for us is that all of these premises, hundreds at a time, are driving our life. And we are so unaware of how it's driving us. And we find ourselves in a war not only with God or Satan, but with ourselves and our lives in general. It's a pervasive, deceptive mind that Paul is calling us to destroy. And we need your help. Destroy these thoughts. Destroy them with God's power and not our own, to constantly tell ourselves the gospel narrative that is eventually going to be so powerful. I heard a story, and I just think about this. It's, it's the reality of how this works. There's a story about this little boy, and uh, they were going caving. The cave was just absolutely pitch black, and he was freaking out. His dad's there with him, and he's just like, losing his mind. This is so scary. This is so scary. This is so scary. That's to the point where it was so dark, he couldn't see anywhere, like right in front of him. He couldn't see anything. And he was losing his mind so much that his dad was like, okay, 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 okay. You see your watch. The kid's wearing a little watch. And he goes, just, just tap the light on the watch. And the kid just goes and he hits the light on the watch. This little insignificant piece of light. And it lit up the whole cave. Because darkness cannot be where the light is. Which means that these destructive thoughts that are happening to our minds, what do we do? Do we uh, sit down? And we tell ourselves affirmations about why the truth shouldn't be there. No, no, no. The only thing you need to do to destroy the strongholds of the thoughts and the ideas is introduce light into your life. The only light that actually has an impact on true spiritual darkness is the presence of Christ in your life. So lean deeper into him. This is not a do more sermon. This is a love him sermon. This is to go with his work and his attack in his offense, with his death on the cross, to defeat Satan, sin, and death, to destroy the power, the presence, and the penalty of sin in your life, and all he's calling you to do is remember. Remember. When the lie enters into your mind, the first thought we have to have is, how do I take this very thought captive? Because as long as we continue to focus on the faulty behavior as our biggest problem, we will expend all of our energy trying to deal with the effects of sin without ever coming to grips with the underlying causes of sin. And the underlying cause is that we sin because we have believed in a lie. In order for us to move forward, we need not only the truth about God and His kingdom, but also the truth about who we are and where we are at any given moment in this journey towards our wholeness. This means learning how to be totally transparent before God without any sense of shame or disgust or being an unfinished work of Christ. We must learn to be totally honest in the presence of God with our unhealed wounds, our emotional triggers, our flaws, our bad habits, our sinful urges, because only then will we, we be able to receive what God has for us in those places. Only then will we be open for the work that he wants to do with us to show us more of who he is. And the question is, are we going to believe in the process? You see, spiritual formation, the act of becoming more like Christ, is an interchange of our ideas for his. It's taking a faulty concept and it's changing its stat status. Think of the idea of taking every thought captive. It is an advancing army, destroying a fortified wall, and taking a captive who is a citizen of one kingdom and making them the citizen of another kingdom. It's changing its status to align with the true king. That is what your job is in your mind. So every time something comes into your mind that tells you something untrue about you, who you are, you are going in the process of taking that very thought captive and putting it under obedience towards Christ. How does this look? It says, everything in my life is telling me that I'm an accident. I take the thought, I change its status, I take it to the cross of Christ, and I bring it to obedience to him and what comes out. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
I cannot get through this. There's nothing that's able for me to go through this pain, this tribulation, or this trial. I take that idea, I take it to the foot of the cross, I wash it through the blood of Christ, I come out the other side, and what does it say? He has made you more than conquerors. What do I do? It's God hates me. While we were still sinners, Christ died for me. I can never be forgiven. Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they have no idea of what they're doing. I am broken and I will never be good with him. He who knew no sin became the sin, our sin, so that you and I in him can become the righteousness of God. I am a sinner. He calls you a saint. I am lost. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Nobody wants me. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I am defeated. The Lord will fight for you. I am worthless for God so loved the world. Take every thought captive and bring it to its obedience to Christ. Thomas Watson said this, the first fruit of love is the musing of the mind upon God. He who is in love, his thoughts are ever upon his subject. He who loves God is ravished and transported with the contemplation of God. What is he saying? Imagine living your life in such a way that regardless of what you were doing, God was always before you. He was always top of mind. Darkness would never be able to get in because light is just too prevalent. And here's the last quote that I'll leave you with. Here's from William Law. Would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays most or fasts most. It's not he who gives most alms or is most eminent for temperance, chastity, or justice. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. And why are we always ready to praise God for it? Because the effects of salvation, of our giving our lives to the truth, does not just have a future effect. It's not just a fire insurance policy where we get to go to this place called heaven and have a good time. That's not what it is. It's an effect that has an actual change now. Because you can be not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of your mind now because of him. You can actually take on the mind of Christ now because of him. And how many of us sit at home and have a war in our minds telling us about the lies and deceptive things about who we are, about who he is, our character, his character, our future, our lives, and our relationships. And all he's trying to say is you are letting lies flood into your mind. And the only difference you have to make right now is think more about who I am. Think more about who I am. Dwell more on my presence. Dwell more on the actions that I've committed for you. And you will begin to realize so much quicker that the lies that have taken over your life, the only thing that can bury you down to the bottom of those things that lift you up is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the truth. He is the truth. He is the truth. It's all you need is the presence of Christ in your life to destroy the strongholds that you begin to live by. Every sin committed is a lie. One of my favorite things is that when God's constantly trying to get his people to remember his character, he just says this one word, his favorite word, remember and they're all just messing around. Israel's messing around constantly. God's just like, do you remember what I did for you in Exodus? Do you remember what I led you? Do you remember when I was with you? Remember, remember, remember. The Israelite people would have a process where they would build altars and put the altars into the ground as a moment to remember. What we're going to walk into now is a time where we are doing communion. Communion is the big standard for us to say, remember, remember. Christ, before he goes to the cross, has some of his best friends in the world around him at the table. And in that moment, he wants to, to put them like a bookmark in their soul. Remember, remember, remember. I've said this before probably every time I've ever done this, but the big thing I like to say is that, uh, you know when you're going on a physical, 
you go to a physical and you're like running on a thing and they're trying to test out all of these physical things about you. It's basically, where are you at physically? And then they kind of tell you objectively. I kind of love the idea that this is like a physical of the soul. It's a moment to sit, to remember him, to get truth into our mind, to get the lies and deceptions out, and for us to hold the most beautiful things into our soul right now, and we offer them to him in the process of taking communion. And so what does he say? He says for us that we are going to take uh, this uh, bread. And the image that he 